Ladies and gentlemen, as, as Mr. Justice Esty said this morning, the law of remedies is constantly changing, and there are, in this 1981 program, only a couple of lectures that are being delivered on the topics that are identical with those that were delivered in the 1961 special lectures. One of them is the lecture we're going to have from Paul Lamech now on equitable remedies. Paul Lamech got a Bachelor of Civil Law degree at Oxford in 1960. He subsequently taught in the faculties of law at the University of Pennsylvania and at Osgood Hall Law School. He has been in private practice in Toronto since 1967 with the firm of Fraser and Beatty. He was called to the bar in 1964 and appointed Queen's Counsel in 1977. Paul is a past president of the Lawyers Club of Toronto and is, as anyone engaged in general civil litigation in Toronto knows, one of our city's leading counsel, Mr. Paul Lamech. It's nice to see a lot of the old faces that used to sit here when I lectured on equity and trust 14, 15, 16 years ago. It's also very surprising to see those faces here, but I suppose that memories fade. I'd love to know, too, who the bastard was who scheduled me to talk on equitable remedies at 3.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> it's true that Maurice Cullity follows me, but he at least sounds funny. <laughs> Don't waste time, though, feeling sorry for me. Give it 10 minutes and you'll be feeling sorry for yourselves. <laughs> in the last six years, there have been three developments of substantial significance in the area of equitable remedies. Two have been in the area of injunctions and one in that of specific performance. Each of those developments sprouted in England. One of them has taken very firm root in Canada. The other has been, a second has been transplanted only within the last eight months. And the third, the one in specific performance, has not yet arrived in Canada but is surely on its way. Now this lecture in its printed form will deal with all three of those developments, but today I can only deal with two, and that only in the barest outline form. I propose to say something about the two developments in the area of injunctions. For injunctions, 1975 was a vintage year. There were two very important judgments that appeared in that year. The American Cyanamid and Ethicon case was decided in the House of Lords, and the case of Mareva, Compagna Navera, and international bulk carriers was decided by the Court of Appeal. And let me turn first and quickly to the American Cyanamid case. In that case, the House of Lords granted leave to appeal for the sole and express purpose of considering the criteria to be applied on an application for an interlocutory injunction. Now, before considering just what the House of Lords did in American Cyanamid, might be useful to refer briefly to the state of the law as it had been understood until then. Going back through a long line of decisions to Preston and Luck in the English Court of Appeal in the 1880s, it had been understood that a plaintiff had virtually no hope of obtaining an interlocutory injunction unless he could first persuade the court that the chances were that at trial he would succeed on the ultimate merits of the action. Unless he overcame that initial obstacle, the interlocutory injunction application probably wouldn't get to first base. Now, once on base, of course, he had some other requirements that had to be satisfied. He had to show irreparable harm would result if the injunction was not granted, that the balance of convenience favored the granting of the injunction, and so on. And he had to give what's rather blithely called the usual undertaking in damages, about which I want to make, say more later. But the point was the inquiry, or so the cases ran, never reached those considerations unless the plaintiff at the outset convinced the court that he had what was variously described as a prima facie case or a strong prima facie case or a probability of success at the end of the, the, end of the day. That was the threshold test. And indeed, in 1965, the House of Lords itself in Stratford and Lindley had confirmed without question 
that the plaintiff who sought an interlocutory injunction had at the outset to satisfy this prima facie case test. And so clearly was that understood to be the law that in American cyanamide itself, the Court of Appeal did not reach the point of considering the balance of convenience on the interlocutory injunction application. The Court of Appeal felt that the plaintiff had not shown that it had a prima facie case of patent infringement, and the court was therefore not obliged to consider the case further. Lord Diplock, in commenting on the treatment of the, the case in the Court of Appeal, Diplock in the House of Lords, put it this way, the Court of Appeal considered that there was a rule of practice so well established as to constitute a rule of law that precluded them from granting any interim injunction unless upon the evidence adduced by both parties on the hearing of the application, the applicant had satisfied the court that on the balance of probabilities, the acts of the other party sought to be enjoined would, if committed, violate the applicant's legal rights. That was the perception of where the law stood and the onus that was placed upon an applicant for an interlocutory injunction after the Court of Appeal had decided American cyanamide. Now, the first and perhaps most remarkable feature of the House of Lords decision in American cyanamide is that Stratford and Lindley, its own decision of 10 years earlier, wasn't even mentioned. And Lord Diplock, with whose speech the other members of the House of Lords concurred, now held diametrical, apparently diametrically opposed to the earlier holding in Stratford and Lindley, now held that the central question on an interlocutory injunction application was not the likelihood of the plaintiff's ultimate success at trial, because he said that is a question that a court on an interlocutory injunction application is ill-equipped to determine. It's faced with affidavit evidence only. Often it is contradictory. He said the central issue on the application is where does the balance of convenience lie? That's to say whether the plaintiff's need for protection in the period until trial outweighs or is outweighed by the damage which may be caused to the defendant if he is restrained until, until trial from doing something which he may at trial be found to have been perfectly entitled to do. And the rule, as the Court of Appeal had perceived it, the rule that the plaintiff had to establish a prima facie case of entitlement to the ultimate relief sought in the action got very short shrift indeed. Lord Diplock put it pretty bluntly. Your Lordship should, in my view, take this opportunity of declaring that there is no such rule. The use of such expressions as a probability, a prima facie case, or a strong prima facie case in the context of the exercise of a discretionary power to grant an interlocutory injunction leads to confusion as to the object sought to be achieved by this form of temporary relief. The court, no doubt, must be satisfied that the claim is not frivolous or vexatious. In other words, that there's a serious question to be tried. And it appeared that this rather formidable hurdle of a strong prima facie case, which it was said the plaintiff hitherto had had to show, had now been reduced to the rather lowly threshold of a claim that was not frivolous or vexatious. But the thrust of the decision appeared to be clear, that the hearing of an interlocutory injunction application was not to be seen as an occasion for the prejudging of the merits of the action. So long as the plaintiff could show that there is something probably akin to what we in another context call a triable issue, <clears throat> the court should go on to give consideration to the questions of balance of convenience and irreparable harm. <clears throat> and importantly, in light of the later cases, Lord Diplock acknowledged, though, that there may always be special factors in individual cases which had to be taken into consideration in determining how high to set that threshold. Let me turn from that very brief summary of the American Sanamid judgment to consider the aftermath of the decision, both in England and subsequently in Ontario. The decision was a good deal less readily accepted and it was a good deal more closely scrutinized in the subsequent English cases than it has been in Ontario. Let me deal, therefore, first with the English cases. We've all been conditioned since first days in law school to think of Lord Denning as being ever in the vanguard of legal change. 
and certainly in the line of cases following the Mareva decision, which I shall deal with later, he's more than lived up to his reputation as the great reformer. But he showed an interesting resistance to the change in the law which had apparently been brought about by American cyanamid. Within three and a half months after the House of Lords decision in that case, Lord Denning found two opportunities to show his fairly obvious dislike for scrapping the old prima facie case test. In Fellows and Fisher, and in Hubbard and Pitt, both decided by the Court of Appeal in May 1975, Lord Denning was able to find what he thought to be special factors, seizing the, the words of Diplock, special factors, taking those cases outside the scope of the general principles formulated in American cyanamid and justifying the application of the old prima facie case test. And indeed, had the process not been cut short, just three or four years later, one really has to wonder whether Denning would ever have found a case so lacking in individuality and special factors as to fall within the general principles of American cyanamid. <clears throat> Fairly, though, the other members of the Court of Appeal in Fellows and Fisher also had concerns about American cyanamid. In particular, what bothered them was this. Lord Justice Brown said, in effect, how on earth is a judge expected to focus on the balance of convenience as the central issue without giving some effect to his impression of the relative strengths of the party's cases. He thought that to be an unrealistic requirement. Now, in 1979, the House of Lords, and indeed Lord Diplock himself, in effect, I don't think he's putting it too highly, capitulated. And that was the decision of the House in NWL Limited and Woods. The House of Lords there went some considerable way towards refining, explaining, and indeed substantially reframing the principles stated in American cyanamid. And the decision can reasonably be viewed as an acknowledgement of the validity of the views and concerns expressed by Denning and the other members of the Court of Appeal in Fellows and Fisher. Lord Diplock said this. When properly understood, which is the way judges always introduce remarks saying I didn't say it very well back then. When properly understood, there is in my view nothing in the decision of this house in American cyanamid to suggest that in considering whether or not to grant an interlocutory injunction, the judge ought not to give full weight to all the practical realities of the situation to which the injunction will apply. Where the grant or refusal of the interlocutory injunction will have the practical effect of putting an end to the action. The degree of likelihood that the plaintiff would have succeeded in establishing his right to an injunction if the action had gone to trial is a factor to be brought into the balance by the trial judge in weighing the risks that injustice may result from his deciding the application one way rather than the other. Now, it's true that there are some recipes where the sequence in which the ingredients are added to the mix has an effect upon the taste. And indeed, this may be one of them. I'm going to suggest later that perhaps it is. But it seems to be clear, at least in England, after the NWL case, and I tell you I know of no reference to that decision in any of the Canadian cases, it seems to be clear in England following NWL and Wood that in, in England there, the law calls for the addition at some one stage or another of an assessment of the strength of the plaintiff's case in all situations where the practical effect of disposing of the interlocutory injunction application is going to be to dispose of the whole case. And, of course, in Fellows and Fisher, it was Lord Denning's view, which you might regard as slightly overstated but not grossly, that in 99% of the cases, once you've disposed of the interlocutory injunction application, there's really nothing left of the case. Now, let's turn to the reception given to American cyanamid in, in Canada, and in particular in Ontario, to see where we're at. The principles stated by Lord Diplock in American cyanamid, and I say again I know of no reference here to NWL and Wood, the ret retraction from cyanamid, the principles stated in American cyanamid 
are now generally considered as having been adopted as the law of Ontario. In Yule Incorporated, an Atlantic Pizza Delight Franchise 1968 Limited in 1977, the judgment of the Divisional Court was delivered by Mr. Justice Corey, who after canvassing the various criteria suggested to him by counsel in the case, concluded that the test and principles of American cyanamide were and indeed had been the law of Ontario. Now that's a conclusion that must have come as something of a surprise to Mr. Justice Dick Holland, because in Cradle Pictures and Penner in 1975, he'd considered American cyanamide, concluded that it didn't embody the law of Ontario and shouldn't be followed. But American cyanamide and Yule have now been followed in at least 10 reported Ontario cases. And acceptance of the reformulated test has thus been ready and widespread. The question is really, I suppose, whether that acceptance has been too ready, and indeed, whether it has changed the law in any significant way. I propose to raise three questions in that regard. First, has American cyanamide lowered the threshold for applicants for interlocutory injunctions? Second, whether it has changed the law or not, has American cyanamide too readily been adopted in Ontario? And third, <clears throat> if American cyanamide has changed the law in Ontario, is the law now in a satisfactory state? First, has American cyanamide changed the law? Now, notwithstanding that he had been a member of the divisional court that decided the Yule and Atlantic Pizza case, Mr. Justice Steele subsequently in 1978 in Carlton Realty and Maple Leaf Mills expressed the view that despite the apparently less stringent formulation of the test by Lord Diplock in American Cyanamid, that case had not significantly changed the law, and respectfully, I agree with that view. Regardless of the words that you may use to formulate the standard that the plaintiff is required to meet, it's reasonable to ask, as Lord Justice Brown did, how any judge can realistically be expected not to attach considerable weight to the assessment that he inevitably makes of the relative strength of the party's cases. The impracticality of contending that once a judge is satisfied the thing isn't frivolous or vexatious, he should put aside his perception of the strength of the plaintiff's case and concentrate solely on the balance of convenience seems to me to be a ra rather obvious. Lord Diplock in the NWL case, as I read his speech there, retreated from that American cyanamid position, if that is indeed what he ever did mean, and he conceded the relative strength of the party's cases is indeed to be considered whenever it appears that the grant or refusal of the application is in effect going to dispose of the whole action. Now, in my view, although I do not believe that American cyanamide has lightened the burden of applicants to the extent that's generally thought, it has changed the law somewhat. If American cyanamide, as refined by the later English cases, says anything, I suggest it's this. That whereas in the earlier law, a plaintiff's failure to establish a prima facie case made it unnecessary for the court to consider any of the other factors, such a failure now is only one element to be taken into consideration. The balance of convenience is now what appears to be the central issue, which is merely, of course, another way of saying that on those applications, the court has to look at the situation in its totality and not focus upon any one element. And that presumably could mean that even though the plaintiff's chances of ultimate success at trial are perceived by the judge to be slight, if he also perceives that to refuse the injunction will be disastrous for the plaintiff, whereas to grant it may, will, may well make very little difference to the defendant, under the, the big ball of wax balance of convenience rule, he may feel inclined in that circumstance to grant an interlocutory injunction where perhaps prior to American cyanamide he would not. <clears throat>
in short, the consequence in my view is that it is likely that some interlocutory injunctions may be granted on some few occasions where they would not have been granted before. Now, next then, have we too readily adopted American cyanamid if that's all it did? And I, I tend to think that perhaps we have. And I recognize that our Court of Appeal hasn't yet spoken on the question. Hopefully its opportunity to do so will arise soon. But I have two reservations about the willingness which our trial judges have shown to accept American cyanamid. First, it has to be remembered that an Ontario judge is very much better able than is his English counterpart on an interlocutory injunction application to form a useful judgment about the merits of the case. One of the considerations that persuaded Lord Diplock that that was not an appropriate exercise for such an application was that the evidence was all by affidavit, the affidavits may well contain contradictory assertions and allegations, and they were untested by cross-examination. And that, of course, reflects the English practice, where cross-examination on affidavits filed on interlocutory applications is virtually unheard of. In our practice, of course, cross-examination on those affidavits is the norm. And the evidence that is before the judge on the application has indeed been tested. And the transcripts of those cross-examinations are usually heavily relied upon in argument, as you know. And I suggest that one has to question, therefore, whether the considerations which in part gave rise to American cyanamid are equally valid in Ontario. And if they are not, then one, I think, is entitled to question the wisdom of an apparently uncritical acceptance of the American cyanamid reformulation of the test. And the second reservation goes to that very point of the, the lack of critical analysis on the part of our courts of what, in fact, happened in American cyanamid. Other than questions raised by Mr. Justice Morden, then sitting as a trial judge in 1975 in the Toronto Marlboro Hockey Club and Tonelli case, and the observations of Mr. Justice Steele in the Carlton Realty case, to which I referred, there's been no ju close judicial analysis at all in Ontario of the scope or the implications of American cyanamid. Its acceptance in Ontario has been largely uncritical. And I've no doubt that generally the bar and perhaps the bench in Ontario have the impression that as a result of American cyanamid, injunctions are easier to obtain in that the requirements to be satisfied by the applicant have been relaxed. That, I am persuaded, is a widespread perception. And the risk is that American cyanamid may come to be treated as authority for a theory which, as a decision has been refi refined, it is probably incapable of supporting. Now, it may be no bad thing. It may be no bad thing anyway if, in the result, interlocutory injunctions are more readily granted. My only point is that the consequence, if that be the consequence, may be more than was contemplated by the House of Lords in 1975 and 1979. But more important, if that consequence is to flow, there should be an awareness of the possibility of the creation of a new imbalance in favor of plaintiffs. And that brings me to my third and last question on this area. If American cyanamid has changed the law, is the law now satisfactory? Let me restate my thesis briefly. I've suggested that the true effect of American cyanamid and the line of cases which have followed it in England is to relegate the strength of the plaintiff's case consideration from the status of a threshold question to that of merely another, although important, factor to be weighed in the balance of convenience. If that be so, and if, in consequence, injunctions may now on occasion be granted in cases where they would formerly have been refused, then there has indeed been a change in the law. But there is, however, an aspect of interlocutory injunctions which, to my mind, has never been very satisfactory, 
and which, with any relaxation in the requirements imposed upon plaintiffs, will become even less satisfactory. And I refer to the protection that is allegedly afforded to the defendant by the plaintiffs giving the usual undertaking in damages. The giving of that undertaking, of course, is now regarded as an essential and invariable condition of obtaining an interlocutory injunction. But in practical terms, that undertaking may afford absolutely no protection to the defendant because no assurance is ever given and none is ever required that the plaintiff will, if necessary, be able to honor his undertaking. Now, that's of interest in the context of an American cyanamid discussion because in addressing the question of the balance of convenience, Lord Diplock said this, speaking about the adequacy of damages as a remedy. If damages would be an adequate remedy and the defendant would be in a financial position to pay them, no interlocutory injunction should normally be granted. If, on the other hand, damages would not prove an adequate remedy for the plaintiff, the court should then consider whether, on the contrary hypothesis that the, def that the defendant were to succeed at the trial in establishing his right to do that which was sought to be enjoined, he would be adequately compensated under the plaintiff's undertaking as to damages. If damages in the measure recoverable under such an undertaking would be an adequate remedy, and the plaintiff would be in a financial position to pay them, there would be no reason upon this ground to refuse an interlocutory injunction. Now the proposition appears to be this, that the adequacy of damage, damages, either as a remedy for the plaintiff, or as protection for the defendant under the undertaking in damages, involves the very practical consideration of whether, in fact, damages are recoverable from the other side. Is he good for the money? And Diplock's suggestion is that if it appears that he's not good for the money, then the adequacy of that protection or the adequacy of that remedy becomes suspect. Now, I've been unable to find any other authority, either before or since 1975, for that proposition. But if I may say so, it makes very good sense. In my submission, there has never been any good reason why our court should not say to plaintiffs in appropriate cases, if you want to have this defendant enjoined until trial from carrying on this activity, you must satisfy us that your undertaking as to damages will be honored if the need to honor it should arise. We're accustomed to all sorts of situations where plaintiffs give security or make payments into court as a condition of obtaining an order. Section 19.1 of the Judicature Act clearly empowers the court to impose such terms and conditions as it deems just upon the granting of an injunction. It's my suggestion that even without any change as a result of American cyanamide, the court should properly consider whether defendants may not reasonably expect greater protection than has traditionally been afforded to them by the unsupported undertaking in damages if, as a result of American cyanamide, uninterlocutory injunctions are to be more readily granted, then I suggest the need for that consideration becomes even more acute. Let me come now to the second of the two significant recent developments in the law relating to injunctions. The decision of the Court of Appeal in Moravia, Moravia Compania Naviera and International Bulk Carriers which to nobody's great concern or astonishment I will call Mareva. It's remarkable that although the 1975 decision of the House of Lords in American Cyanamid, which after all may not have changed very much, should have had almost immediate and widespread impact in Ontario, the Mareva case, which was decided by the English Court of Appeal in 1975, and which was a much more dramatic departure from the previous law, should have had no discernible impact in Canada until 1980. Now, what is known as the Mareva injunction by a peculiar quirk of presumably the English was, didn't have its genesis in the Mareva case at all. It had its genesis in the decision of the English Court of Appeal 
a few weeks earlier in 1975 in a case called Nippon Yusen Keisha and Karagiorgis. And let me get, begin, therefore, with that case. But first again, let me try to summarize the legal situation that Nippon and Mareva were to change. A plaintiff in England and in Ontario had ever been at risk that no matter how meritorious his action might be, by the time he was able to obtain a judgment, the defendant might have made himself judgment-proof, either by perhaps dissipating his assets, alienating them to friendly transferees, or spiriting them, and perhaps spiriting himself, out of the jurisdiction. And often the plaintiff's only prospect of being able to enforce his judgment when he got it was to embark on a round of judgment debtor examinations, start new litigation to set aside fraudulent transfers, perhaps start foreign litigation to enforce the judgment in whatever jurisdiction he might find the defendant to have assets. The only pre-judgment remedy available to an Ontario plaintiff was under the Absconding Debtors Act, under which, as you know, attachment might be obtained of any assets which an absconding Ontario resident might be so careless as to leave behind. And where the defendant was a non-resident of Ontario, notwithstanding that he had assets here at the time the cause of action arose or the writ was issued, there was absolutely no assurance, of course, that by the time judgment came around, those assets would still be available for execution. Now, both here and in England, the decision of the English Court of Appeal in Lister and Stubbs in 1890 had been considered good law. And that was the case, you will remember, in which the Court of Appeal had said, no, we have a great deal of sympathy for you, plaintiff. But we will not enjoin the defendant from dealing with his assets pending your obtaining a judgment. You are a creditor of his, is your allegation. Until you've established by judgment that the debt is owing, the assets of the defendant are his own, and we will not interfere with his dealings with them. And it took a Lord Denning again some 85 years later, to change that rule. Now, the Nippon case, as it turned out, had a fact situation which can be very simply stated, but which was characteristic of many of the cases which followed it. The plaintiff was a Japanese ship-owning company, and it entered into a charter party with the brothers Karagiorgis, whose offices were in Piraeus, the port of Athens. The defendants failed to pay the amounts required under the charter party. The plaintiff attempted to find the the defendants, only to learn that they disappeared and their office in Piraeus was closed. But he did discover that the defendants had funds on deposit in a bank account in England. And the plaintiff therefore instituted an action against the defendants in England on a basis which isn't made absolutely clear in the report, and fearing, not unreasonably, that the funds might be promptly transferred out of England, moved for an interlocutory injunction to restrain the defendants from disposing of or removing their assets then within the jurisdiction. In the first instance, surprisingly, in light of the long line of cases from Lester and Stubbs, Mr. Justice Donaldson dismissed that application. The plaintiff appealed to the Court of Appeal. The Court of Appeal allowed the appeal and granted the injunction. The main reasons for the grant of the injunction were those of the Master of the Rolls, Lord Denning who in what must surely be as bold a judicial step as even he has ever taken, said this. We are told that an injunction of this kind has never been done before. It has never been the practice of the English courts to seize assets of a defendant in advance of judgment or to restrain the disposal of them. It seems to me that the time has come when we should revise our practice. There is no reason why the High Court or this Court should not make such an order as is asked for here. And he based that view upon Section 45 of the English Supreme Court Judicature Act, which corresponds to Section 19.1 of our own Judicature Act, which gives the Court the power to make injunctions whenever it is just and convenient to do so. And Lord Denning said, look, if we don't give this injunction, this plaintiff is going to proceed to to trial, he's going to get his judgment, and it's going to be worthless. The only way to preserve or to protect his right to recover damages at the end of the day is to grant the injunction. 
and in slightly over half a page of terse prose, Lord Denning calmly set aside the jurisprudence of 85 years without once mentioning Lister and Stubbs. It was an astonishing performance. Indeed, it was probably that very omission that prevented the new remedy from being called the Nippon Injunction, because until Lister and Stubbs had been squarely dealt with, the legitimacy of the new doctrine remained in some doubt. Now, that state of uncertainty didn't last very long. The Nippon case was decided by the Court of Appeal on May 22, 1975. One month later, Mareva came before the court, composed of Lord Denning and Lord Justices Roskill and Ormrod. And on June the 23rd, 1975, Lister and Stubbs was summarily laid to rest. Lord Denning didn't make any attempt to distinguish the case. He didn't say it was wrongly decided. He didn't even expressly say that it should no longer be followed. But he did mention it, just to let people know that he hadn't overlooked it. And having mentioned it, he ignored it. And the injunction was granted again. But in the course of the Moreva judgment, Lord Denning stated this new principle which he had fathered in this way. If it appears that the debt is due and owing, and there is a danger that the debtor may dispose of his assets so as to defeat it before judgment, the court has jurisdiction in a proper case to grant an interlocutory injunction so as to prevent him disposing of those assets. And the two other members of the Court of Appeal concurred and the injunction was granted. Now, the next case in the line to come before the Court of Appeal, again rejoiced in a very long and difficult name, and I shall call it the Razu Maritima case, in March 1977. Now, in Nippon and in Moreva, the defendants had not appeared to argue against the granting of the injunction. In Razu Maritima, for the first time in the Court of Appeal, the defendant was represented. The plaintiff was the appellant in the Court of Appeal, an ex parte Moreva injunction being granted and then dissolved. And in responding in the Court of Appeal, on which Lord Denning presided, counsel for that defendant very boldly contended that Nippon and Moreva had been wrongly decided and the court did not have the jurisdiction which it had purported to exercise in those two cases. Now, in dealing with and rejecting that submission, Lord Denning went back again to Lister and Stubbs and that line of cases, and he now appeared to distinguish them. And in language which is very interesting, not only in light of the subsequent cases, but in light of the balance of his own judgment in the Razu Maritima case itself, Lord Denning said this, so far as concerns defendants who are within the jurisdiction of the court and have assets here, it is well established that the court should not, in advance of any order or judgment, allow the creditor to seize any of the money or goods of the debtor or to use any legal process to do so. There are statements of the highest authority to this effect, citing inter alia Lister and Stubbs. But he went on, none of those statements were made, however, in relation to a defendant who was out of the jurisdiction, but who had money or goods in this country. I do not think they should be applied to cases where a defendant is out of the jurisdiction but has assets here. And it would appear from that passage that Lister and Stubbs had suddenly been raised from the dead again, and it was alive in respect of defendants within the jurisdiction. And it would appear, therefore, that Denning was saying that the Moreva injunction is only available against the non-resident defendant. Now, that appearance didn't even survive to the end of his judgment. <laughs> In the final paragraph of his judgment, Lord Denning says... I think the courts have a discretion in advance of judgment to issue an injunction to restrain the removal of assets, whether the defendant is within the jurisdiction or outside it. <laughs> the first life of Lister and Stubbs lasted 85 years. The second lasted about 10 minutes. The Lord Denning giveth and the Lord Denning taketh away. All right, after the Razu Maritima case, it seemed that the way lay open for a very rapid expansion of the power to grant Moreva injunctions. By 1979, approximately 20 such applications were being made every month in England, and most of them were being granted. And all that despite the fact that the existence of the jurisdiction had never been confirmed by the House of Lords. Indeed, it still not has been. 
A Moreva case did go to the House of Lords in um, 1977, the Siskina case. But there, the existence of the jurisdiction was not an issue, and the House of Lords did not pass upon that question. But that case is important in one other respect, and this too, I think, has a bearing in Ontario. A limitation was placed upon the assumed jurisdiction to grant a Moreva injunction. The foreign plaintiffs in the Siskina case, in their English action against the foreign defendant, claimed damages and sought a Moreva injunction. There were monies sitting in England to the credit of the defendants. It was clear that the English court had no jurisdiction to entertain the damage claim. And the question that arose for decision was where, therefore this, whether the jurisdiction to grant a Moreva injunction extended to a situation where the plaintiff had no other claim justiciable in England against that defendant. Now, the Court of Appeal, Lord Denning again presiding, reversing the judge at first instance, held that the jurisdiction did so extend and they granted it the injunction. Now if that view were sustained, it would mean that the mere presence of assets within the jurisdiction owned by a non-resident would be enough to give the court jurisdiction to grant a Moreva injunction against the owner of those assets, even though the court totally lacked jurisdiction to entertain any substantive claim against him. That was the effect of what the Court of Appeal did in Suskina, and the House of Lords would have none of it. They held unanimously that a Moreva injunction could not stand alone. It was ancillary, interlocutory relief, and was only available in aid of a cause of action which the plaintiff was asserting in an action in respect of which the English courts had jurisdiction under their rules of practice. Now, I want to refer to only two more English cases and then come quickly to the Canadian situation. The first is the third Chandris shipping case in the Court of Appeal in 1979. And I mention that for this reason. It was in that case that Lord Denning took the opportunity to formulate guidelines or requirements for the grant of a Moreva injunction. He formulated them as follows. The plaintiff must make full and frank disclosure of all matters in his knowledge which are material for the judge to know. Now that and the second requirement that I'll mention in a moment reflect the fact that the initial application for a Moreva injunction is usually made ex parte. If you serve your notice of motion on the defendant that you're gonna move for an injunction to stop him moving his assets, by the time the motion is returnable, you may as well go home, I suppose. So the ex parte application, as we know, requires counsel for the moving party to make full disclosure of the all relevant information to the judge. Second, said Lord Denning, the plaintiff has to give particulars of his claim against the defendant to the court, stating the ground and amount of his claim, and fairly stating the points made against it by the defendant. Third, the plaintiff has to show some basis for believing that the defendant has assets within the jurisdiction. Fourth, the plaintiff has to show some ground for believing that there is a risk of those assets being removed from the jurisdiction before a judgment is satisfied. And the Court of Appeal was very clear that the mere fact that we're talking about a non-resident is not per se enough to show such a risk. And fifth, the plaintiff must give an undertaking in damages, which, as Lord Denning said, in a suitable case, should be supported by a bond or security. Now, let me refer finally then to the judgment of Sir Robert McGarry, the Vice Chancellor, in Barclay Johnson and Ewell. On the facts of that case, the prerequisites for the grant of a Moreva injunction, as they've been formulated by the Court of Appeal, were all satisfied. The only problem was the defendant was not a foreigner. At the time of the application, he was thought to be off on his yacht cruising on the high seas somewhere, but he was an English national, normally resident in England. The Vice Chancellor McGarry granted the injunction. In his view, the heart and core of the Moreva injunction was the risk that before the plaintiff could obtain judgment, the defendant would spirit his assets away. And McGarry saw no logical reason to think that if that risk could be removed in the case of a non resident defendant, it should equally be removable by a Moreva injunction in the case of a resident defendant. 
the nationality, domicile, or residence of the defendant was not determinative. The only question, said McGarry, was whether there was a risk that assets would be removed. Now, before I track the Moreva injunction across the Atlantic, let me add further comment about the state of development of the Moreva doctrine by 1980. By the time Moreva arrived here, it had been considerably defined and refined in the English courts. Its five-year life had been one of rapid maturation. Its popularity among plaintiffs had generated a constant stream of cases and opportunities for the courts, both trial and court of appeal, to explore the limits of the doctrine and its ram the ramifications of its application. One thing was pretty clear by the time Moreva arrived on Canadian shores, a Moreva injunction was not, and it is not, a form of pre-trial attachment of assets. The Moreva injunction is an injunction. Injunction is an equitable remedy, and equity acts in personam. A Moreva injunction is directed against the defendant, not against his assets. It prohibits the defendant from doing certain things with or in relation to his assets. And that distinction is of substantially more than academic interest. A plaintiff, by acquiring a Moreva injunction, acquires no interest in the assets, and he is not transformed into some sort of secured creditor. And therefore, in a case called Cretanor Maritime, an Irish marine management, in the English Court of Appeal, where the defendant's only assets in England were funds in a bank account, and where, subsequent to the granting of the Moreva injunction, the defendant defaulted under a debenture held by a third party, the court held that the plaintiff had no interest in the funds of the defendant in England, and that the injunction did not prevail over the rights of the debenture holder. We're not talking about pretrial attachment. Now, in 1980, it was the first time that a Moreva injunction was granted in Canada. There had been one earlier and unsuccessful application in 1978 in the case of OSF Industries and Mark J Investments, a decision of Mr. Justice Lerner, and the Nippon, Moreva, and Razu Maritima cases had been drawn to Mr. Justice Steele's attention in a case in 1978, but he'd expressly said he wasn't relying upon them. The pioneering decision in Canada was that of the Supreme Court of the Northwest Territories in BP Exploration Company and Hunt. In that case, BP was seeking to enforce in the Northwest Territories a judgment which it had obtained in England against Nelson Bunker Hunt, and it sought a Moreva injunction to restrain Hunt from disposing of certain valuable oil exploration permits which he held in the Northwest Territories. The Moreva injunction question was fully argued by counsel, both of whom were from Toronto, was fully considered by Mr. Justice Tallis of the Supreme Court of the Northwest Territories, and he, in the course of a lengthy judgment, reviewed all of the relevant English jurisprudence to date and concluded that he did indeed have jurisdiction to grant a Moreva injunction, and he did so. He held furthermore, and this may be of interest too in our jurisdiction, that notwithstanding that the rules of the Northwest Territories Supreme Court contain provisions which correspond roughly to our absconding debtors legislation, notwithstanding that, the jurisdiction to grant a Moreva inju injunction was present and was exercisable, and there was no conflict between those two. To my knowledge, there have only been two Canadian cases since October 1980 in which Moreva injunctions have been sought. The first was the case of Ellis Guro Inc. and Sang Yong Shipping in the Federal Court Trial Division, an unreported decision, as far as I know, of Mr. Justice Collier, where he held that on the facts before him, there was no basis upon which the court could assert jurisdiction over the non-resident defendant, and service ex juris, therefore, couldn't be allowed. But he did say that he had no doubt about the power of that court to grant a Moreva injunction in a proper case, he indeed said that he had concluded that if this were a proper case for service out of the jurisdiction, 
he would have adopted the English guidelines as set out in the third Chandra shipping case and granted a Moreva injunction. As at the date of this, my preparation of this lecture, the most recent decision on Moreva injunctions is that of Mr. Justice Montgomery of our own Supreme Court in Liberty National Bank and Trust Company and Atkin. The reasons for judgment were released on February the 6th of this year and as far as I know are as yet unreported and I'm grateful to counsel for the plaintiff in that case for bringing it to my attention. But after a full review of the authorities, starting with the judgment of Mr. Justice Lerner in the OSF Industries case and continuing through the Moreva lines, lines of cases in England and such as they were in Canada, Mr. Justice Montgomery concluded that he would adopt the principles stated by Lord Denning in the Moreva cases, that he would adopt the formulation of the guidelines for the grant of Moreva injunction set out by Lord Denning in Third Chandra's shipping, and that the court did indeed have jurisdiction to grant that kind of an injunction. Now, there are strong indications that the pace is picking up in Canada so far as applications for Moreva injunctions are concerned. A strong argument, I think, can be made for the proposition that the Moreva injunction is well suited to a country like this with 10 separate legal jurisdictions and a high level of foreign investment and business activity. But in more general terms, I suggest, in closing, that the Moreva injunction can be seen as an indication that the courts are alive to and concerned to remedy a weakness in the practical application of a jurisprudence. In our law generally, and in commercial matters in particular, the legal system appears to presume and be premised upon the honesty of the citizen, even the citizen who is sued. And in the vast majority of cases, that assumption and premise are valid. But as every practitioner knows, a determined defendant who is intent by fair means or foul to defeat the effective operation of the legal process can probably do so. And the Moreva injunction goes some considerable way towards frustrating such efforts. Now, of necessity, I've not been able to do any more today than merely trace in the sketchiest outline the development of the two lines of cases flowing from American Sanamid and Moreva. In the lectures it will be published, that outline is considerably fleshed out, and there's also discussion of the House of Lords 1979 decision in Johnson and Agnew, which is important on the question of election of remedies in relation to specific performance. But I trust that even today's outline demonstrates what in my view is palpably true, that is that equity is alive and well and living in England and is being carefully tended by Lord Denning, and its emigration thence to this country may be of considerable value to the development of our own legal system. Thank you.